So, I want to talk about Melchizedek in Hebrews 7, and uh, you might think that that's a bit of a bit of a hard job, isn't it? All complicated. Well, I'll say this to you, that the closer you look at God's ways, the more beautiful they become. Beauty becomes even more wonderful the closer you look. In contrast, I think, to anything of, of man, of the flesh, you know, the closer you look, it breaks up. The closer you look, and it is human artistry. The closer you look at God's ways, there is something profound here, something that gets more and more beautiful the closer you analyze it. So we got Hebrews 7 here, and he's talking about Melchizedek. And well, I'm going to say Paul wrote Hebrews, but you'll bear with me if you, if you don't agree. But anyway, I think Paul's argument is that, look, Jesus is to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek, so the psalm says. So let's look at Melchizedek and see how he looks forward to Jesus. But first of all, I want to clear up a few misunderstandings, because people reading this on a surface level come to the wrong conclusion that Melchizedek is Jesus. And that's not the case at all. Absolutely not the case at all. Because the Lord Jesus is we're told, a priest like Melchizedek. He is not Melchizedek, he is a priest like Melchizedek. And consider, the writer says, how great this man was. He is a man. He is not uh, the incarnate Son of God or, or whatever. And so, as you look more closely at this, you... Uh, and you see, you'll see it in the context of the whole letter to the Hebrews. And he starts off by saying in chapter 1 that Jesus is not an angel. Jesus is not an angel. And actually that is the theme that's continued here, because the Jews had this idea that there was to be a mighty angel called Melchizedek who was going to come and save them from the Romans. And Paul is saying, no, Melchizedek was a man who looked ahead to the Lord Jesus. And so, to, to, to read this and say, well, Melchizedek is Jesus, is to totally miss the point. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that after the order of Melchizedek, after the likeness of Melchizedek we've read, there arises another priest. So then, he was without father and without mother, not in the literal sense. Nobody is without father or mother apart from God himself. Jesus himself had a father, had a mother. The idea is that his genealogy is not recorded. The same phrase used about Esther, oddly enough, she was without a father or mother. Well, not, not literally. The idea is that, of course, Jesus is a priest like Melchizedek was, but that priesthood does not depend upon genealogy. And all the time, you're going to see this, that he's arguing here by way of contrast. The priests under the Jewish system, the priests from Levi, were only priests because they were from Levi and could prove their descent. But Jesus was from Judah. And so the point is that, well, this priest after the order of Melchizedek was not based at all on your genealogy. That's the point. So having cleared that up, let's get into the text. So, verse 1, this Melchizedek, king of Salem, which is Jerusalem, was priest of the Most High God. He met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. If you remember, the kings of Sodom and other people around there had been attacked and their people had been taken away, including Lot, etc. And then Abraham chases after them with 318 men and rescues them and brings the spoil back. And Melchizedek comes out and blesses him. Now, the king of Jerusalem, Melchizedek, he was not someone who'd been attacked. He just came out and blessed Abraham, although Abraham had done nothing for him, as it were. And that blessing, we are being told, is the blessing, the same kind of blessing, that the Lord Jesus gives to us. Now, how did, how did Melchizedek bless Abraham? He gave him bread and wine. And here we are with bread and wine. Now straight away, you see something absolutely relevant to us. So then, he was blessed with bread and wine as a sign of a blessing by grace from this great high priest. Well, what does that mean? It means that the bread and wine represents something that is being done to us. 
that we are being blessed. And of course Abraham is then told that because you have been blessed, now you will be a blessing. When you come to Acts 3, Peter interprets the blessing given to Abraham not only as the blessing of everlasting life and eternal inheritance of, of the land, but also of being turned away everyone from your iniquities. So, the blessing then that Melchizedek gave to Abraham, Abraham was then to go out and to bless other people with. And this is the blessing that we have. So, again I say, Melchizedek blessed Abraham through giving him bread and wine. And that is exactly what we are receiving now. Now that raises the question, this bread and wine that we take, I mean, does something kind of metaphysical happen to us now as you take it? Well, on one hand, you've got the pole of saying, no, nah, it's all just a symbol. On the other hand, you've got the big mistake of the Catholic Church to say, no, nah, it turns into the actual body and the actual blood of Jesus. Well, that's not right. And yet, somewhere between those two poles, I think it would be true to say that something happens with this bread and wine. Something happens. It is a sign of God's actual blessing of you. Remember, Abraham was blessed by Melchizedek, not because he'd done anything for Melchizedek. He had for the king of Sodom, but not for the king of Jerusalem, which was Melchizedek. So, it's all of grace and a sign that God wants to bless you. Not get rich quick and all that sort of stuff of, of the prosperity gospel, not at all. No, he's not, that's not in view. Far more important than that, the blessing of forgiveness of sin and of therefore eternal inheritance in God's kingdom. So then, we're told then that he, that this required, verse 12, that the priesthood was changed. Because in the psalm it says that Jesus will be made a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And so he says in verse 12, the priesthood being changed requires a change of the law. Or as verse 18 says, there is an annulling of the previous commandment because of its weakness. So God changed. There was a change of the priesthood, so there was a change of the law. There was an, an annulling of the former commandment. And yet we're told that the, the law of Moses was eternal, and that the priesthood of Levi is called an everlasting priesthood, an eternal priesthood, and yet it's changed, we're told here. So God changes. That's difficult for people to accept. Our Adventist friends will say, no, no, if God said something, you've got to keep this law, you've got to keep it forever. That's it, it's an everlasting covenant. But here we're told that, no, it changes. The priesthood was changed, so the law was changed. Now you might say, yeah, what about Malachi? I am the Lord, I change not. Indeed, but read on. I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. In other words, what is unchanging in God's way of operating with us is the fact that he will always have grace and mercy upon his people, upon his Israel. That's the point. But God does change. Forty days, Nineveh shall be destroyed. No terms and conditions attached. But they repented. And so God changed his mind. He says this in Jeremiah. If I say something about a nation and they repent, well then I shall change what I said. Now this is a God that is quite different to all the conceptions of God, especially with the Greeks and the Romans, where a God, by definition, had no emotion, had no feeling, had no change, was not touched by human situation. Whereas the one true God, and of course there's no other God apart from him, the one true God is not like that. He does change because he is so sensitive to us. That's the thing. He is so sensitive. And he wants by all means to almost try to force through his, his plan with us. Well, it's emphasized very much that these Levitical priests, that they lived and they died, and they were weak, they were morally weak. Whereas the priesthood of Jesus is eternal. 
how are we to understand that? The idea is that because Jesus lives forever, therefore his, his priesthood is eternal. I have sworn and will not repent. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In what sense then is the priesthood of Jesus eternal? Under the law of Moses, people sinned, they went to the priest, offered a sacrifice, they got forgiven and that was it. But the priesthood of Jesus is offering more than that. It is offering what we, we're told is perfection. Verse 19, the law made nothing perfect, but the work of Jesus does. And that's why verse 11 says the priesthood had to be changed because it could not bring anything or anybody to perfection. So then, the, the scene under the law of Moses was that man sinned, went to the priest, made the offering, got forgiven. End of. And I fear that that can be our attitude, even as Christians, even as in Christ now. That we sin, we, we mess up, we go to God. Through Jesus we ask to be forgiven. And that's where we think it finishes. But the priesthood of Jesus is more than that. The law made nothing perfect. But Jesus does. His intention is to, as, the, as this chapter finishes, is to perfect forever those who are sanctified. How can we then be perfected? Only because we are in Jesus, who is the only perfect one. The idea is that you and I will come to perfection. Now, to someone who's not spiritually minded, that is neither here nor there. Oh, well, I shall be morally perfect one day. So what? Yeah. For those of us who are spiritually minded, for those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, we shall be filled. We who wish so dearly, more than probably anything else, that I would not sin, that I would not fail, that I would not commit sins of ignorance, sins of omission, these are the things that normally get people like you and me, as well as, okay, sins of commission, we all fail. We wish more than anything that we would not have those kinds of failures in our lives. And yet, we do. And so the great hope is that we, therefore, will be perfected because we are in Jesus, who was our representative, had our nature, but did not sin. And this is the wonder of this new priesthood that is operating for us. And in that sense, the mediation of Jesus for us is eternal. That raises quite a lot of issues, that his mediation is eternal. Because, in a sense, he mediates for us even after we are dead. Sure, we are not conscious. Sure, we are, death is unconsciousness, that, that is quite clear. But he is mediating for us in a, an eternal sense. And literally eternal. Okay, Jesus comes, we're resurrected by his grace within his kingdom. But his priesthood is eternal. It is, we've read here, a priesthood after the power of an endless life. So that means that throughout the ages of eternity, we shall be there, we shall be saved because of him. Now what we're doing now, as you take, uh, as you take bread and wine, is to thankfully remember that he has forgiven me, that he has redeemed me, and more than forgiven me, but saved me, and I will be in the kingdom because of him. And what we're doing now, in, in a very small, obscure kind of way, taking our bread and wine in gratitude and thankfulness, the spirit of this is what we will do forever and ever. What you're doing now is you break bread. In essence, in spirit, we will do this forever in God's kingdom. So we have here a little foretaste of how things will eternally be. You see, if you shrug, if you're a person of the flesh of the world, and you shrug and say, oh, yeah, Jesus died for me, and so what? He forgave my sins, I couldn't care less, I'm going to go out and commit some more. There wouldn't be a lot of point in being in God's kingdom then, would there? But for all those who love his appearing, we will be there, Paul says. So, in that sense, his priesthood is eternal. Now, he says then in, in verse 19 that 
he has brought in a better hope through which we draw near to God. There was no solid hope of salvation under the old priesthood. As I say, you sinned. You went to the priest with your offering, you got forgiven. End of. And you went away again and came back with the next sin. This is not how our lives should be. Because his priesthood has achieved something far more than that for you and me. That he has therefore brought in a far better hope. As this word elpis, as in elpis Israel, the hope of Israel. But, you know, this is one of the biggest mistranslations. I don't like to go on about, oh, the Hebrew means this and the Greek really means that. I don't like uh, to, to mention that too often, but I have to say it here. That elpis, as in hope, does not really mean hope in the way that we tend to use the word hope for the best. No, it means a certainty. Elpis Israel, the absolute certainty of God's purpose with his Israel, which is you and me. And this is the, the difference, again, it's always by way of contrast between those high priests and this priest after the order of Melchizedek that he has brought in an absolute certain hope. And I wondered why the translators have messed up all the time. When they meet Elpis, uh, hope, they give it. There is another Greek word that means hope, as you and I understand the word hope. Well, hope for the best, well, I hope so. You know, that sort of thing. No, that's not the idea. Absolute certainty. That is how it should be translated. And why didn't they? Well, I think they didn't for the same reason that you and I balk a little bit at the idea that our salvation is absolutely certain, absolutely certain. That it is not just a hope, you know, hope of the kingdom, well, I hope so. Will I be saved? Well, I don't know, but I hope so. No, we are missing the point. It is an absolute certainty. Otherwise, you see, we're still in the mentality of Israel under the law, that you sin, go to the priest with the animal, get, get that sin scribbled, and you come back with the next one. Whereas, no, there is this absolute certainty in Jesus, whoever lives to make intercession for you, that you will really and truly be in God's kingdom. Absolutely certain. And why do we balk at that? Why do, why do we not want to fully accept that? I, I don't accept that, oh, it's because I'm humble, because I realise I'm such a sinner, I'm so weak, or, you know, I'm, I'm too humble for that. No. I think it is probing a bit deeper into our psychology. I think it's that if I believe, and if I know, that if Jesus comes back now, or I have that heart attack and I'm gone now, right, I will be saved. I will be in God's kingdom. If I believe that, well, that's going to take over my entire life. This is no longer a hobby. This is no longer a mere religion. This is no longer something you do on Sundays. This is an absolute life-gripping experience. That should I die now, or if Jesus comes back now, I will live forever. It is an elpis, it is this certain hope. And then piling sort of logic upon logic, he says in verse 21, the Levitical priests were made priests without an oath, but this one with an oath, and he quotes in the psalm, the Lord Yahweh swore and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. Well, this is developing what he said in chapter 6, where he says that, God confirmed the certainty of his purpose with us by two things, by the promise and by the oath. Now, as I began by saying, the closer you look at these things, the more wonderful it all becomes. It really does. He made a, a promise. God made a promise. You will be saved. That's it. Believe me, God says to man. Believe me, you will be saved. And then he makes an oath. He confirms the promise by an oath. 
And he's saying that this priest, Jesus, after the order of Melchizedek, who will definitely save you, not just get sin forgiven as it happens, but will absolutely save you, this has been promised and it has been confirmed by God's oath. And because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. He swore on his own life. And God can't die. That this is true. And so Paul says in Hebrews 6, because we have this promise as well as an oath, we have a strong consolation. So why did God make an oath to, to back up his promise? Isn't God's word enough? Of course it's enough. So why did he make an oath? Not for his own benefit, but for our benefit, so that we might see it. And Romans 15, Paul says the same thing. He said, sure, God made the promise to Abraham that we will be in his kingdom. And he confirmed it through the death of his son. Why did Jesus die? Well, that's multifactorial. That's got a lot of answers. But one answer is that he died to confirm the promises, that his death was, as it were, the oath that backed up God's promise on his own life that he would save us. So we have, well, all commentary is kind of, the bathos really is sort of inappropriate, because we are being assured that really you will be saved. Little me, I will be saved. You will be saved. We will be saved. And God has confirmed that with an oath, not simply his own word. Sure, if God says something, that's it. God gave us his word. But he goes beyond that and gave us an oath that was confirmed by the death of his son. Putting it in other language in Romans, Paul says that God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. He commends or confirmed his love to us. It's as if he's trying every which way he can to get us to see this, to, to get us to grasp this, that really it's okay. I held my dear mother in my arms as she died. And she had these questions. Duncan, she was speaking very softly, panting. I hope I'll be in the kingdom. And I said, Mum, it's all going to be okay. You'll be there. It's all okay. And we are no better than my dear mum, who lived a good life. But like all of us, well, I suppose you could say weak uh, in her faith, but like all of us are in that sense. Will I really be there? Wanting to hear that word of confirmation. Yes, you will be. It's okay. And we don't have to wait till the day of judgment to hear that. To hear those words coming into your ears, in my mum's case and her own son, that it's okay, mum. You'll be good. It's all going to be okay, mum. You're going to be saved, Mum. It's okay. <laughs> you don't have to wait to the Day of Judgment to hear that. You don't have to hear it from your son comforting you on your deathbed. You've got the confirmation here. This is the whole point. You are blessed with, 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 with the bread and wine. You are, Jesus died to confirm the oath. Sorry, to confirm the promise. His death was the confirmation. God commended his love. He confirmed his love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. This is, as I say, is only one aspect of the Lord's death, but one aspect of it was to confirm to us that it's okay. You will be saved. But as I say, why do we squiggle and wriggle against it? Because if it is okay, as it is, then this is no mere religion. This is no hobby. This is no mere denominational allegiance. This is no social club. This is not trotting out a meeting on a Sunday. <coughs> <coughs> on a Sunday to, you know, see your friends and your family and so forth. This is absolute reality that you and I will be there. As I said, all commentary is really bathos for me. 
this is it, and this is what we have been told. And, and we're told that this Melchizedek priest, who was a priest like Melchizedek, he's going to do this forever. He has brought in eternal redemption, and unlike with all the priests who came before, God himself swore and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. And the point is developed that that being a priest forever means that you and I will live forever, that it's all true, it's all okay, that we really will be there. So he goes on to say, look, all the priests who came before, well, they only served for a short time and then they died. But this priest is forever. And there is this, well, we're all weak, you know, there is this fear, I think. Will, will I be let down? Will this be another disappointment? Joining religions, churches, denominations, having relationships with people, all these things are to some degree liable and prone to disappointment. And there's so many people who've been baptised and I say, well, why don't you believe this? Uh, I'm disappointed. I was disillusioned. What they mean is, sure, they were disappointed in the church. They were disillusioned. But they're not separating church from God or church from Jesus. Because in him, there is no disappointment. There is no disillusion. How can there be with this huge level of encouragement and confirmation of God swearing on his own life, swearing over, as it were, the blood of his own son, that I am serious. The Lord swore and will not change his mind, the psalm says, you are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. And the point is developed in Hebrews 7, that that means a priest forever, that means he gives us eternal salvation. So then, it is not a case of sin, repentance, getting forgiven by a priest, and then coming back in the same old thing. There is more to it than that. There is the better hope, which I said, the elpis is the absolute certainty of salvation. There is the absolute certainty of life eternal. He is a priest forever who will save you forever. And this, as if it needed any confirmation, was confirmed by an oath with God assuring us that I not only gave you my word, I'll give you more than my word. I will confirm that promise with an oath. And Romans says that that confirmation was through the death of the Lord Jesus. So we have so much to be thankful for and so much to allow to sink in to us that this is for real. As I say, that this is no mere theology, that this is no intellectual adventure, hobby or whatever. We are dealing here with absolutes, with the absolute certainty of salvation. And as I say, when I probe myself as to why I might doubt that, and as I see other people shrugging and saying, will I be in the kingdom? Maybe. I don't know, I hope so. But I'm not sure. Yeah, I suggest the reason we balk at it, the reason we squiggle and wiggle, uh, that assurance of salvation is because if salvation is that assured this is no hobby this must grip my whole mind my thinking my life decisions how i structure my life it is not for me any longer it is for him so with those things in mind let's uh, let's break bread and let's bear in mind that hebrews in my opinion is maybe a transcript of a breaking of bread exhortation. If you want to think about that further, you can have a look at the uh, NEV commentary on Hebrews, and I've given some reasons for thinking that. But that's just some homework for you. Uh, let's just read the words from 1 Corinthians 11. I have received of the Lord Jesus that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do, in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he'd eaten, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do, as often as you drink it, 
in remembrance of me. So this is to remind us, this bread and wine is to jolt us, that wow, this is all absolutely true and all absolutely real for me. And it is the cup of the New Testament. What's the New Testament? The New Testament, Paul says, the New Covenant, is in fact the promises made to Abraham. It was actually made before the Old Covenant, which the Lord Moses uh, was even given. That was a temporary thing. The promises to Abraham, the hope, the absolute certainty, the elpis of Israel, abides absolutely clear as it was to Abraham that you are to be blessed, you are blessed as he was by Melchizedek, not because you did anything, not because I owe God owes you anything, but by pure grace. And it was symbolized in Melchizedek giving Abraham the bread and wine. So let's, let's give thanks for the, for the bread. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we try to thank you in human words for this bread, for this symbol to us of his outgiving, which was your outgiving, your gift to us, your desperate attempt to assure us that you love us. And we, with maybe shaking hands, accept it. With all the gratitude that we as men can muster. In Jesus' name, Amen. This cup is the cup of the New Testament, Jesus said, in my blood. The New Testament, the New Covenant, is the very simple promise to Abraham. I will bless you. I will save you. I will give you eternal inheritance of this earth. I will give you eternal life. Simple as that. And that's God's word. And would God lie? No. But to encourage us to believe it, he confirmed the promise with an oath. Or as Romans 15 puts it, Jesus died to confirm the promises made to the fathers, which are the new covenant. And so, why did Jesus die? I'll say many reasons for that, but one reason is quite simply to assure us that it's okay. I'm for real. God commended or confirmed his love toward us in that while we were still sinners Christ died for the ungodly and we've repented from that we've been baptized and this cup then is the symbol of that confirmation it's as if God is holding our hand and saying it's all okay let's give thanks Heavenly Father what more can we say we thank you that you have gone to such effort to confirm to us your love. We pray, Father, that we might believe you, that we might not doubt anymore, that we might really and soberly believe that we will be saved by your grace. And we pray, Father, that we will not believe in vain, but that we might naturally live lives that bring forth the fruit of that belief. For Jesus' sake. Amen.